thank you, Stephen. Um, and I should say that those excavations 100 years ago, I didn't do those. <laughs> I may have been in archaeology for 20 odd years or more, um, but I don't go back that far. And thank you all for fighting your way through the rain today. I certainly had to, so I do appreciate you being here. Um, the project that I want to talk to you about tonight, um, I've actually been involved with for about 10 years since the trustees of Glastonbury Abbey first came to me with a problem um, of uh, a huge archive of unpublished excavations. And it, it was a project which um, alarmed me to begin with uh, and then gradually seduced me. As Glastonbury does with, with everyone who, who gets involved with the site, it becomes a bit of a lifelong passion and, and uh, there's no sign of, of me relinquishing my links with Glastonbury anytime soon. So what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is really the project that I've been involved in, um, what it tells us about Glastonbury Abbey and the way in which it challenges some of our previous assumptions about the site. It's a site which um, requires quite a lot of introduction in terms of the history and the legend. I'm going to try and explain this quite quickly to give those of you who may not be as familiar with the site an idea of why Glastonbury is so famous. Many of you may know all of the, the history and legend of, of Glastonbury. Others will have heard of it, but not quite sure what its significance is. So Glastonbury Abbey really holds a unique place in the history of medieval monasticism for a variety of, of reasons. It's reputedly the earliest monastic foundation in Britain. I'll come back to that. It's, that's, that's one of its legends. We know that it's the, the only um, Anglo-Saxon monastery to have remained in religious use through the Viking raids. That's partly its, its location in, in Somerset. It's well known because of its association with St. Dunstan, who was abbot first of Glastonbury and eventually became Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was the, one of the figures um, very closely associated with the reform of English monasticism in the 10th century and really re-establishing um, monastic life in England. It has associations with the West Saxon royal house with burials of, of a number of, of kings. And it was an extremely wealthy Anglo-Saxon and later medieval monastery. It was the wealthiest Anglo-Saxon monastery at Doomsday Book in 1086 and at the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539 it was second only to Westminster Abbey. So it's um, a site of, of considerable importance but the thing, the really gripping thing about Glastonbury Abbey and what draws people in is really its origin story and the way in which the medieval monks became involved in cultivating their own origin story. Uh, and these stories, the narratives around Glastonbury, uh, continue to influence um, our interest in Glastonbury today. So it's, it's well known that the monks deliberately cultivated this, this origin story in order to claim Glastonbury as the earliest and the most important monastery, not just in England, but actually in Western Europe. And the first stories go back to the life of St. Dunstan, dated to the 10th century, in which they claimed that they had this ancient church, a church that was so ancient that they didn't think it was built by the hand of man. They thought it was built by divine agency. Then in um, 1130, William of Malmesbury, a, a well-known historian of his time, uh, describes the church at Glastonbury, which he said is the oldest of all those that I know of in England. And in it are preserved the bodily remains of many saints. And he describes this in some detail. He's an eyewitness, and this is a reconstruction, fanciful reconstruction from, from the 17th century. But we know that in the early 12th century, there was a church an old church, for Tusta Ecclesia, which they believed to be extremely ancient. That church was destroyed by fire in 1184, and that's a really important part of the Glastonbury story. In terms of the historical evidence for the origins of Glastonbury, there's been recent reassessment of the Archive of Anglo-Saxon Charters by Susan Kelly, published a few years ago, and she has shown that the historical origins of the Abbey probably go back to about the 670s, up to around 700 AD. Um, so we now know that there's no historical evidence surviving for a religious foundation at Glastonbury before the late 7th century. But the medieval monks believed that their church and their monastic foundation were much earlier. 
And they also believed that they had descended from an early Celtic foundation with strong Irish connections. They thought that St. Patrick and St. Bridget had visited Glastonbury in the 5th century and they claimed to have uh, relics associated with them. But the story gets ever more fantastic so that by the mid 14th century they claim that this old church, this ancient timber church at Glastonbury, was founded by Joseph of Arimathea. And that's why many of you will have heard of Glastonbury. According to the Gospels, Joseph was the man who donated his own tomb for the body of Christ following the crucifixion. And then there's an apocryphal link that Joseph may have been the great uncle of Christ. And the Glastonbury legend claimed that Joseph had been sent to Britain by Christ's disciple Saint Philip together with 12 of his followers. And they believed that uh, Joseph founded the church at Glastonbury in AD 63. So the monks spun this story. They developed it over a series of generations. There are a broad range of issues that come into this, like French romance literature and the legend of the Holy Grail. There's all sorts of things that I could talk to you about for hours, but don't worry, I won't. But the point is that the monks of Glastonbury Abbey managed to establish a direct connection between their abbey and the life of Christ. So this story of Joseph of Arimathea bringing in a biblical character um, meant that they had uh, the sort of premier abbey in, in Western Europe. Um, as if that wasn't enough, they also had the association with King Arthur, which is the other reason why you'll have heard of Glastonbury Abbey. Um, the monks achieved international notoriety by claiming to have found the graves, the joint grave of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere in 1191. And this was des described in detail by a, a contemporary observer, uh, Geraldus Combrensis, Gerald of Wales. Now the body of King Arthur was found in our own days at Glastonbury, deep down in the earth and encoffined in a hollow oak between two stone pyramids. In the grave was a cross of lead placed under a stone. And so it goes on. This um, date is quite significant. You might remember that the old church, the very important old church, was destroyed in 1184. Uh, they also had lost their patron, King Henry II, um, and they needed funds in order to rebuild. And modern historians have argued that the story that built up around the discovery of the grave of Arthur and Guinevere was all part of an attempt to build up a secular cult at Glastonbury, which would draw in pilgrims, bring in funds, and allow them to rebuild. So this origin story, the dual myths of King Arthur and Joseph of Arimathea, are, are what made Glastonbury internationally renowned in the Middle Ages, and they continue to be important in Glastonbury's allure today. Um, excavations during the 20th century sought evidence for Arthur, Arimathea, and a Celtic island of saints associated with Patrick and Bridget. But the true archaeological story of Glastonbury Abbey has remained largely untold. It's not quite as, as um, glamorous as, as the King Arthur stories, of course. But what I got interested in was the fact that this huge archive of excavations had taken place, uh, had been built up in the 20th century. There were 36 seasons of excavations between 1904 and 1979 funded by the Society of Antiquaries of London and the Somerset Archaeology and Natural History Society. And there were eight different field directors, including some really big names in the history of medieval archaeology. Um, but the really shocking thing was that these excavations were never published. And these were not minor excavations. If I show you all phases of excavation here, the um, little narrow blue um, trenches were from the 1950s and 60s uh, when a well-known archaeologist Raleigh Radford excavated there. The big open areas in green are actually the earlier excavations, the early 20th century ones. Um, so this lack of analysis of the excavated material, the lack of publication, has been a major stumbling block, both to scholarly assessment of the significance of the excavations, but also for interpreting the site to the public. I don't know how many of you have visited Glastonbury Abbey, but even if you know a lot about monastic sites, it's a really challenging site to understand. So for a site of such major historical and legendary significance, the lack of archaeological understanding has been a glaring omission. And the lack of publication um, also confronted the trustees of the Abbey with, with an ethical issue. 
because they'd undertaken 36 seasons of excavations and destroyed the archaeology, but not actually published the results. Um, and, and arguably, the Society of Antiquaries was implicated in that as well, having, having funded the excavations. So that's where I came in, innocently one day, answering the phone and being asked to take on uh, the Glastonbury Abbey Archaeological Archive Project. Um, this is a joint venture between the trustees of Glastonbury Abbey and the University of Reading. It's funded, funded principally by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, but we've also had funding from the British Academy and a number of, of smaller bodies, as well as individuals who actually excavated at the site in the 1950s and 60s who, who've made contributions. And the project has yielded a wealth of, of detail and new evidence that's been published in the monograph. But I would also add that the, the full archive not just the slimmed down published version there. The full archive is uh, freely available um, on this website here, an archive with the Archaeology Data Service. And I think all you need to do is Google Glastonbury Abbey Excavations Archaeology Data Service and it'll take you there. Um, so these two products, out outcomes of, of the, uh, the project are available now and we're actually in the next phase of, of work because as I said my association with Glastonbury has continued. And what we're doing now with additional funding from the AHRC is we're taking the results of the academic analysis and we're trying to make sense of those to improve the presentation of the site to the public for the 100,000 people who visit the site every year. And I'm going to show you some digital reconstructions this afternoon, some of which have never been seen before <laughs> by the public anyway, um, uh, to show you what we've been doing. So the next phase of work is making this work relevant to uh, the local community, to the visitors, to schools who, who visit Glastonbury Abbey. Um, what I'd like to do in, in the rest of the lecture is to go through some of the key questions that we asked of the archive and show you some of the, the major findings. This is very much a superficial skating over the surface because this is um, quite a, a, a large-scale um, survey. So here are some of the key questions. Is there evidence for occupation predating the Anglo-Saxon monastery? Now that's the really exciting one because we know that the historical evidence says 670 onwards whereas we have all this legendary material telling us that there are earlier things happening at Glastonbury. The second one is about the scale of the Saxon monastery and craft working centre. Um, then there's the uh, question of whether the emphasis placed on myth and cult created a distinctive layout in the medieval church and cloister. And then there's the archaeological evidence for the construction, form and development of the medieval abbey buildings. I'm only going to be able to touch on that. And the, the material culture and what it reveals about the monastic lifestyle. I'd like to show you one or two slides of, of the portable material culture to show you um, the quality of objects coming out from Glastonbury. So the project began with documents like this. This is the, 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 the higher quality end of the, of the archive from the 1950s and 60s. And although there were eight excavation directors, it was really the work of uh, Rolly Radford in the 50s and 60s that formed the major part of our work. And the, uh, the project really began when, when Radford died as a very elderly man, I think he was 99, and his personal archive uh, finally became available. Um, the archive was predominantly complete, but it had never been pulled together materials had never been mapped uh, or in any way and the first thing that we had to do was uh, scan and transcribe and, and try and make sense of this by using an integrated archaeological database and it's that record that is available on the archaeology data service um, site. Um, we also had to um, re-examine the material culture, the actual objects that had been excavated, those that had been kept anyway, uh, and we had 31 different archaeologists working on this project, some of them who were um, statistical specialists, some of them were pottery specialists, a huge, huge range of people. Um, so the, the work that I'm talking about today um, represents um, this, this huge collaborative project. We also had to undertake geophysical survey. And partly that's very helpful for knowing what may survive, what hasn't been excavated yet for deposit mapping. Um, but there was a, a really essential aspect to this work at Glastonbury, and that's that um, we needed the geophysical survey in order to locate the excavation trenches 
because the quality of the excavations varied so much, and actually over the course of the 20th century, um, the various archaeologists were keying their surveying into different things that have moved, and so we had to start again with locating some of the archaeological trenches. And I think that may be one of the reasons why Raleigh Radford was never actually able to publish this material, that uh, before, the age, before the digital age of archaeology, really, I think it would have been very difficult for anyone to pull all of this material together. So our aim was to, to set aside previous assumptions based on the historical and legendary tra uh, traditions and to provide a rigorous reassessment of this archive of antiquarian excavations. So I'm going to go through the key findings according to those questions that I set out. The first one being about evidence for occupation predating the Anglo-Saxon monastery. Well, I think this is one of the most exciting aspects. <clears throat> Previously, we haven't known of any um, early um, occupation on this site. We've actually got a considerable amount of evidence for prehistoric and Roman occupation, but the most exciting stuff are those fragments of pottery there. Now, archaeologists always say this, but these particular bits of pottery are really important. They are called late Roman amphora, uh, and they, um, you can see what they looked like in their original as a, as a complete vessel from the British Museum. The reason these are so important is that they were imported from the Eastern Mediterranean, carrying oil and wine, and they date to about 500 AD. Now, there are two things that are important there. The first thing is that this is a really high-status trade, importing oil and wine. The second is that previously our archaeological evidence around Glastonbury doesn't take us any earlier than around 700 to 750. So finding this on site, something dated around 500, is very important. It's even more exciting when I tell you that these, these were um, associated with a trodden floor um, and the material appears to have been in situ rather than residual material that's just been churned up and moving around the site. Um, and the floor is associated with a series of, of large post pits, which are these um, things here. I'm not going to sort of draw um, a series of buildings there, but I'm pretty certain that we have a large timber hall, one or more large timber halls with this very high status early pottery. Now, this is quite important because it challenges the existing um, models about Glastonbury. Um, the existing model is that Glastonbury Abbey was a secondary location to Glastonbury Tor and Beckery, where there were um, uh, early Christian hermitage sites. Uh, it now seems that it's at least contemporaneous with those and that we have a whole network of early Christian hermitages in the, the marshes around Glastonbury um, in the 5th or the 6th century. So that really, um, it gives us a lot to think about in terms of, of the legendary tradition of Glastonbury, and it supplements the detailed historical work that's been uh, done on the charters. The other question about the early period, of course, is Arthur's grave, because Raleigh Radford um, claimed in 1962 that he had found Arthur's grave at Glastonbury. Not a grave with a skeleton in it, but the pit or the grave from which the monks had exhumed Arthur and Guinevere in 1191. And he used historical sources in order to try and orientate himself and find the approximate area in the monk's cemetery in front of the, the Lady Chapel there. Um, and he started digging. And it took him a couple of seasons before he found something that he thought was convincing as Arthur's grave, and he announced this to the press and so on. And he was very confident about his uh, dating because he had, in, in, in his pit there, he had chippings of dolting stone, which he believed was used for the first time um, after the fire and, and the rebuilding of the old church. So he thought that gave him a date of about 1190. Um, and then he had these early burials here, or these burials which he believed were Celtic or British burials of the 5th or 6th century. But when we went back to Radford's own notes, it was clear that there, were some, there was some circular reasoning going on. Um, and the, um, this green stuff that you can see here, this is a, a, a dumped clay deposit associated with the period of St. Dunstan in the 10th century. Um, and the kissed graves that he thought were late are actually cut into this material, so they're later than the 10th century. And their closest parallels are 11th century graves at uh, Winchester and Wells, 
We also know that the dolting stone that he used as part of his dating argument appears in, in all periods of, of the site's history, including the Anglo-Saxon sculpture. So his dating evidence was, um, was problematic, um, and there's no evidence that this was a grave. It seems to just be a, a pit with um, some residual pottery in it. So that's quite disappointing, those of you who wanted to hear that we'd found the grave of, of Arthur. Um, but there was quite a lot of um, press coverage around this when I said that the evidence wasn't very good for Arthur's grave at Glastonbury. Um, and the way the press interpreted it, they thought that I was saying definitively Arthur was never buried at Glastonbury. And of course, we, we can't say that as archaeologists because all we can say is that that pit that Radford found is certainly not the grave of Arthur. And his desire to find Arthur was rather stronger than his archaeological evidence. Um, but I think it's very unlikely that archaeology can prove or disprove those, those legendary associations. And it, it's not the sort of thing that archaeologists set out to do these days. In the 1950s and 60s, they were really keen on finding archaeological evidence for Arthur. Um, we're more interested these days in intangible cultural evidence, intangible heritage, and what Arthur may have meant to medieval people and to people today. So uh, the second question was about the scale of the Anglo-Saxon monastery. And the combined evidence of the excavations and the geophysical survey gives us quite a good indication of that. And particularly this long feature here, which is um, the, the boundary, uh, the vallum ditch, the boundary of the Anglo-Saxon monastery. Because basically, they defined or enclosed monasteries in order to distinguish between the sacred space inside the monastic enclosure and the secular space outside of it. And even in the Anglo-Saxon period, this seems to have been a, a really important uh, means of defining um, sacred space. So. Um, Radford excavated this massive um, ditch here. It's really quite a, a significant feature. And this seems to um, be the, the potential uh, monastic vallum. We've also been able to chart other um, excavated ditches, some of them um, before Radford, and some of them uh, much more recently in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Some of these more recent ones outside the boundary of the Anglo-Saxon monastery um, have had radiocarbon dates which is encouraging, um, and they give us um, dates from the 7th to the 10th century. And with, if we assume that these are, are linked, of course we don't know that, we do need to do more excavation or, or coring to, to determine that, it gives us the boundary of the Anglo-Saxon monastery as opposed to the much larger site of, of the medieval one. It's also important because it's showing us that Glastonbury, as an Anglo-Saxon monastery, was consistent with the southern English tradition of a square enclosure, as opposed to the Irish tradition where there was a round vallum around the monastery. So this is um, quite important. Um, the next thing in terms of the Anglo-Saxon um, monastery is the the series of Saxon churches, and this is really important evidence and quite substantial evidence, excavated in the 1920s. And uh, the whole area of the, the nave of the later medieval church was excavated, and a series of three churches were found. Um, not well photographed, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to talk you through this. The important thing is they found something here called an opus signinum floor. This is reused Roman pottery and tile and things, um, reset to create um, a Roman floor. It's, it's something that's used extensively in Kentish churches. It seems to have been a, a church of, of two or three chambers here. And remember, at this time, there would have been also the old church, the timber one that would have been there. So you have that old church, this Saxon one, and then a freestanding um, structure which is uh, subterranean. There were stairs down into it. Um, and in its eastern wall, there was this um, slab that was drawn, uh, which seems to have had an aperture for viewing relics. So this is basically um, a mausoleum where um, the early saints and founders and things, remains were, were um, uh, stored. Much more exciting is when you use <laughs> when you put all that evidence together, and this is what you can come up with. Um, so the ground plan is showing us this for the first phase of the church. This sort of evidence we've had to extrapolate from other sites, um, but we have tried as, as um, much as possible to give you um, an accurate idea of what the scale and appearance of the first phase church would have been. 
The second phase, they actually extended the eastern wall of the church and they took in that freestanding crypt there. Um, and they also um, extended east and west and they seem to have built an atrium, an open space at the west, which would have joined it with the old church, this church uh, built by divine agency. And this is what we've come up with in terms of, of the reconstruction. And the reconstruction, this is an archeological reconstruction, so it's all based on uh, the, the measured plan, which is a much more time consuming thing to do, but at Glastonbury was, was quite important, I think. And then finally, the third phase of the church, um, they extended the, e the church eastward again, um, constructed a large tower over the former crypt, um, exhumed all the remains and left them in a large stone coffin there, um, and um, again built some additional um, chambers onto the north and the south. And the final reconstruction shows you the scale of the Anglo-Saxon church. This was really quite a, a substantial structure. This, so by the time we're at this stage, this is contemporaneous with St. Dunstan and the reform of, of English monasticism in the, in the 10th century. And Glastonbury, the, the, the churches at Glastonbury, the, the way I've just outlined the way they developed, that's very, um, uh, it's very much a common pattern for English monasteries to begin with a series of separate churches all on the same axis and for them to be joined up and built around over time. So this, this sort of um, sequence that I've outlined um, holds good for a great many um, Anglo-Saxon monasteries. Also of this early phase, associated with the Anglo-Saxon churches, we've got this really important find of um, Saxon craftworking, glassworking. Uh, five glass furnaces were excavated in 1955 to 1957 in the area of the later medieval cloister garth, but close to these Anglo-Saxon churches. Uh, this is really important because these are the only Anglo-Saxon furnaces to have been excavated in England. We have glass from many sites, um, but this is unique in that the, um, the floors of the furnaces were intact, um, along with around 300 associated finds. Um, and you can see a, a reconstruction based on uh, the archaeological evidence and also some experimental archaeology done by um, glass specialists. When these were first excavated, Raleigh Radford suggested a date of the 9th or the 10th century um, those dates have since been challenged on a variety of uh, factors. The first is that the glass itself seems to be earlier. M more and more excavations were carried out at places like Southampton, where they found 7th century glass, and it was very similar to the glass from Glastonbury. So the dating didn't seem to be right. But one of the exciting things when we went back to the material remains in the museum at Glastonbury Abbey is that we found soil samples and charcoal remains from these furnaces. It's remarkable that they kept those in the 1950s. It wasn't standard practice at that time. Um, and we've been able to get radiocarbon dates from them. And people were skeptical. Not all of it was still viable. But um, we were able to get five good radiocarbon dates. Um, and we've done some statistical analysis on them as well. Um, and this is basically showing that it's likely that the glass making was a short-lived single event likely to date to the late 7th or the early 8th century. And the furnaces would have provided window glass for the first stone churches at Glastonbury, as well as glasses, glass vessels, beakers and so on, um, used by the monastic community. We've also done chemical analysis of the glass, and that confirms that the glass that they were making at Glastonbury was recycled from Roman materials. So they weren't making it from raw material. They were importing glass cullet taken from Roman sites. And they were probably also importing specialist craftsmen from France along with the glass cullet because this was not um, a, a, a tradition um, until the sort of major founding of the monasteries in England. Uh, so the dating evidence from the glass furnaces, the radiocarbon dates, can also be used to help us with dating the construction of the first stone church at Glastonbury to roughly around 700 AD. That works in terms of the plan form, the presence of the opus signinum flooring, um, and it also corresponds with the charter evidence 
very closely, um, particularly with the reign of King Inna of Wessex, who's credited with uh, having a major role in founding or refounding the monastery. So it's one of those rare moments when all of the sources seem to work together. So I'd like to say a little bit about the, the later medieval monastery. This is, um, I've focused on the early monastery today, the Anglo-Saxon monastery, because I think that's what people are interested in. Um, but the later medieval monastery is completely unknown, and the publication is the first to, to really show even the basic plan of Glastonbury Abbey. And I'll just draw your attention to a couple of uh, quite what I find quite interesting things to do with the abbey that really relate to the legends and the traditions of the old church, etc. So this is how the, the, the actual layout of the abbey was uh, determined and sh or shaped by um, some of the legendary tradition. So I think the most distinctive thing at Glastonbury is that the Lady Chapel here is at the western end of the church. Those of you who know your cathedrals, like Ely and places like that, the Lady Chapel is normally at the eastern end of the church, sometimes to the, to the northeast of the church. Um, the monk's cemetery was also to the west here, whereas normally the monk's cemetery is around the, the eastern end, and this area would have been used for less sacred burials, members of uh, families, lay patrons of a monastery. And the reason why we have this focus of sacred space around the western end of the monastery is because of the old church. That church that was described by William of Malmesbury that burnt down in 1184, which they believed was founded by Joseph of Arimathea. It's an extremely sacred part of the site. The most sacred part of the site is here. The Lady Chapel was reconstructed over the old church. So this is what they were focusing on. Now this, this meant that um, they decided to have the monk cemetery at the western end rather than the east, as far as we can see, which is uh, unique. And also, very unusually, they never completed a west range to the monastic cloister. Now, occasionally, at sites of much lower status, like monastic granges and some um, uh, lower status sites, you don't have a full cloister, and you might be missing the western range. But at a major Benedictine monastery of this status, this is extremely surprising. And I think it's because of the sacred nature of this site and its impinging on the cemetery there that they didn't want to have the West Range. Because the West Range was traditionally the range that was used for the abbot's lodging and it would provide um, accommodation for high-ranking guests who would come and stay with the abbot. So instead of building it there, the abbots of Glastonbury built what seems to have been a sort of self-contained palace, really. Um, they had... Um, they were very aspirational, the abbots of, of Glastonbury Abbey. Um, and so they had more or less a second cloister down here, which I'll show you in a moment. And by keeping the, the West Range, um, by, well, by not uh, building the West Range, they were able to have um, exclusive views of the Lady Chapel and across the, 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 the monk cemetery. So I think it's also to do with the abbots controlling this area. But this is, I think, to me, one of the most interesting things about the, the, um, the analysis is that um, we've been able to identify aspects in which the planning and development of the monastic buildings took account of the legends and the history and particularly the stories around the origins of Glastonbury Abbey. So the um, archive has also allowed us to do a bit of work in, in reconstructing the later medieval plan Starting in the late 11th century, we have really only very minimal evidence here. Um, and Radford did try and reconstruct a, a, a fairly complex eastern arm. I'm, I'm relatively, um, relatively comfortable with what he's done there, but I, I wouldn't particularly want to go further than that. The interesting thing in this early phase of uh, Norman work is that we don't seem to have a cloister and monastic buildings. They appear to have used the late Saxon monastic buildings and they didn't build a new cloister um, until around about 1150. That's not unique. It is known at a few other sites, but it's somewhat surprising. And it may be to do with the uh, specific circumstances at Glastonbury Abbey. The transition from Anglo-Saxon to Norman Abbey was was quite um, uncomfortable. Um, the first, um, so the last Anglo-Saxon abbot was taken hostage by King William in 1067, and he put in place Turston, the first Norman abbot. 
And the monks and the abbots were, uh, were unable to get along, and in, in fact it culminated in a bloody battle in, in the church, and a number of monks were actually killed. So it wasn't a slight disagreement about when you had dinner. It, this, this was kind of you know, passionate um, conflict going on, and that certainly uh, delayed the development of the monastic buildings. In contrast, the 12th century building campaign um, was quite spectacular. Um, again, we have relatively limited evidence around the eastern end of the church, but we do start to get quite firm evidence for the monastic cloister and buildings. And this ambitious program of work can be attributed to the abbey's fourth abbot, Henry of Blois, who was grandson of William I, nephew of Henry I, and brother of King Stephen. And John of Glastonbury, the um, Abbey's first chronicler, um, states that um, Henry raised from their foundations the bell tower, chapter house, cloister, lavatorium, refectory, dormitory, the infirmary with its chapel, a beautiful and spacious palace, I think that's the Abbot's palace, an attractive gate of dress stone, a great brewery, and stables for many horses. So this was a, a massive building program in the mid 12th century. And the best evidence that we have for that um, are the, uh, the architectural fragments from the cloister. These are a fantastic group of around 40 um, capitals and other fragments in the local Blue Lias limestone. And of course they would have been fabulously painted in, in the 12th century, so we don't get a, a, a sense of that. But I think you can see how richly carved they are. Um, they certainly class as amongst the best Romanesque sculpture uh, in England. Um, we've also been able to reconstruct those on the basis of the surviving capitals. Um, again, this is an archaeological analysis, so we've spent quite a lot of time looking at the diameter of the shafts, etc., um, and challenged previous um, uh, assumptions about what these may have looked like. And this is the new work that's been going on in, in the last few months and was not part of, of that monograph. We also have contemporaneous with Henry of Blois' work, a uh, fabulous um, 12th century stained glass, which is known as durable blue. It's um, a particular um, composition which is known at York, Winchester, Chart, and Saint Denis. Uh, the, it shows the importance of Glastonbury and the fact that it was operating in this sort of very high status uh, courtly milieu. Uh, but the really interesting thing is that this glass was still in place at the dissolution, despite the fact that the church was destroyed by fire, etc., in 1184. So they think this is important enough that they're actually collecting it and reusing it. And that's a real pattern at Glastonbury. It was so interested in promoting its own history um, that it continued to use and reuse early materials. Um, we've also been doing reconstruction of the Lady Chapel, which is the part of the building, that, the part of the abbey that survives most intact, showing what it, it would have looked like um, with its very rich um, polychromy. That's based on um, archaeological analysis. We've been able to show uh, the sequence of the rebuilding of the church. This is work by Jerry Sampson based on architectural fragments and standing evidence rather than the excavated material. So he's been doing this work to complement the work that we've done on the antiquarian excavations. I won't go into that in any detail. And then finally, we've been able to reconstruct the full later medieval plan in, in all its glory for the first time. Um, so um, you can see um, the chapter house here and the uh, former dormitory, uh, the refectory, uh, the reredort or the latrine block here, the monk's kitchen, and this massive complex here associated with the abbots, which I'll just can you do it? Yes, go on to. So the abbots' hall complex, we have the fabulous surviving kitchen, of course, to, to show you where you are, but we also have a, a massive hall. Um, that is certainly rebuilt in the 14th century. I think there is one before that, though. Um, in the abbot's kitchen, we've recently found deposits dating to around 1250. The building itself dates to around the 1330s. So we know these later buildings are replacing an earlier abbot's complex. And then we also have evidence for a large um, courtyard garden and a second hall here, which was built in the 15th century. And we've been able to do quite a lot of work in terms of reconstructing that 
um, partly through using the geophysics evidence um, in order to supplement excavations that were done there in the 1970s. We've also got illustrations by William Stukeley, who visited the site in the 18th century and um, shows quite clearly that second hall and its relationship uh, to, the, to the kitchen there. So as part of the work that we've been doing, we've been able to reconstruct the, the sort of scale and mass of the Abbott's complex. This is so hot off the presses that I really just copied that from an email yesterday. So this is very much work in progress, um, uh, but it gives you an idea of how we will be able to transform the understanding of visitors to the site. They'll have a much better understanding of what they're looking at. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to show you some of the monastic material culture, what the portable material culture tells us of the site. Um, because this, these excavations were carried out in the 20th century, they were selective about what they kept. So in contrast with a modern excavation where you'd be doing lots of environmental sampling and you'd keep all your animal bones and fish bones and things like that, they were very selective. They didn't even keep all the pottery and things, but they did keep anything that they thought was religious, high status, or early, okay? But um, I think we are missing quite a lot of the everyday materials which earlier excavators didn't think were important. So having kind of explained that background, the pattern of the assemblage of material culture at Glastonbury is very much biased towards the religious and the high status. It is, of course, a monastery, so you would expect that. Um, but we have a very large number of objects associated with monastic literacy and music. Things like writing tools, book mounts and clasps, a book binding tool um, here, um, as well as things like um, oyster shells containing pigments that would have been used as palettes for, um, uh, while you were illuminating manuscripts. Um, so this is consistent with what we would expect as a monastery um, but of course, Glastonbury had a famous scriptorium, and that is reflected in some of the material culture. We also have quite a, a lot associated with religious devotion. This isn't always the case with monasteries. You don't always find things like um, relics and portable objects. Um, but we have found um, a number of things associated particularly with veneration of the Passion of Christ and with the Virgin Mary. And I, this is a, a particularly delightful plaque which has a rose on it, the symbol of the Virgin, and it has passages from the Song of Songs. So it's particular veneration of the Virgin. Here we have a terracotta roundel with the, um, the sort of wound, pa wound of the passion um, representing Christ there. Um, and also things like an ampulla holding holy water, uh, a tiny reliquary with IHS, uh, meaning Christ on it. So um, a range of um, portable material culture reflecting the religious aspects of the site. And then huge quantities of pottery reflecting more um, the economic connections of the um, community. So of the pottery assemblage that they kept, remember they threw quite a lot away, there are 8,000 fragments. And it includes glazed tablewares imported from northern France and locally made products, particularly from Bristol. It was quite surprising, actually, as a, a monastery of this status, that there were very few imported materials. It wasn't right until the end of the Middle Ages that you start getting things like these um, Italian um, maiolicas and so on. Most of the connections are showing um, local connections, particularly with Bristol. And the Abbey did itself own many properties at Bristol, and these trading connections are reflected in the assemblage. We also have 7,000 ceramic tiles representing a wide range of uh, motifs, including some unique ones, uh, possibly representing some of the abbots. Abbot beer here, representing grains of, of wheat from, from making beer. Um, but the um, chemical analysis of the um, ceramic tiles, again, showed that they were very much made locally, even just within the Glastonbury area. So the abbey was clearly underpinning um, local um, economy, um, very much uh, contained within its region, um, not so much acting as an international player um, based on the material culture that we have. So just to draw this together, um, 
I hope that's given you uh, a sense of the, um, the range of things that we've looked at in the project, but, but ho hopefully also outlined some of the new evidence for the scale and the significance of, of both the Anglo-Saxon monastery and the later medieval abbey. The distinctive elements of planning have become apparent that were collected with the abbey's legends and also the status of its abbots. And the project has also revealed that some of the best known archaeological facts about Glastonbury such as Arthur's grave, are themselves myths perpetuated by the Abbey's excavators. So the archaeological myths um, combined with the historical myths have been a big aspect of, of the project. We've also identified a number of new questions for future research. We have questions remaining about the later medieval plan. For example, I didn't mention the infirmary complex. There are still questions about where that may be. So there are still lots of questions to ask about Glastonbury. And a striking feature of the finds assemblage is that we're really lacking any early material associated with the Saxon monastery. We have very few finds um, dating before 1000 AD, um, and I think it's likely that we have not yet located the core of the Anglo-Saxon monastery. I showed you the churches, but we know very little of the domestic buildings, and I think it's possible that they're located to the north of the medieval church in an area that hasn't been excavated. One of the most um, exciting things, I suppose, is the question about um, the origins of Glastonbury Abbey and what was at the site in the 5th or 6th century. This is the, the evidence of that late Roman amphora pottery associated with the timber hall. This reopens the question of whether there was an early religious settlement based at Glastonbury before the foundation of the Saxon monastery in the late 7th century. We don't know whether that occupation was religious or secular in character, or both. Um, but certainly evidence for post-Roman settlements at Glastonbury will no doubt fuel speculation on Glastonbury's Arthurian connections. So publication of the archive, uh, both the monograph and the, and the digital version, has brought this material to, uh, to the public domain for the first time. It represents the culmination of work by the project team, but also a series of archaeological generations stretching through the 20th century, and, and, and hopefully acquits the ethical obligations of the Society of Antiquaries and the trustees, but it also throws up a huge number of new questions, um, new challenges that will um, hopefully encourage, stimulate new archaeological research and possibly even excavations in the future as this work sparks new questions, debates and interpretations. Thank you.